All right, hello, yes. Development. Back in the deep, dark backwater time of um, 20, 2013, two insane designers, Chris and Tyler, probably over a glass of whiskey, decided to ditch their, job, ditch their job at Backbone Entertainment. Okay, I might have written this as a joke, but this is unironically how it happened. Listen. We had some whiskeys and I remember like looking at each other like, no, for real, we're gonna do this thing now, right? And he's like, cause I just got an offer from this company and kept asking each other, like, are you serious? Cause we're gonna do this, man. You know, we're gonna do this, man. And back and forth. Like, I think we probably just said the same thing for like four hours. They both had a little bit of money, but ended up being one of the first properly kickstarted games, raising just over $300,000 to make the game. They even reached out to a government fund in Canada called the CMF, who basically told them that investing in them wasn't worth their time and to get bent. The main gameplay loop and how it played out got thrown around a bunch, but ultimately they settled on this. Wait, that comes later in the gameplay section. <clears throat> the original reveal trailer for the game, released back in late 2013, was made as a vertical slice of what the game was supposed to be like, both for consumers to know what they were going to be buying, and for the devs to realize what the hell they were going to be making. This is also where the ancestor came from, as they invited Wayne June over to do a little bit of narration for this video, and then just decided to include him in the full game. When PAX 2014 rolled around, it was the first time anyone outside of the dev team had ever played the game, and despite the devs being incredibly worried over how it would go, it was incredibly well received. Early access popped up and it did better in a week than they ever thought it would do. To this day, it's considered one of the few early access games that were considered early access done right. That was until about half a year after its early access launch when they added corpses and the Darkest Dungeon community turned more feral than Rick and Morty fans. I'm Pickle Rick! I don't want to imagine how absolutely terrible this was for the dev team, but the decision that they came to I think was incredibly mature and respectable. They made corpses the default choice, as it was their vision for the game, but they made it completely optional. The game actually fully released at the end of 2016 to major praise and applause from uh, just about every single person on the planet, except those that hate RNG. I mean, can you imagine? The vibe. There's probably less circles in this game than I have fingers on my hands, Everything is pointed with rough edges to reinforce that everything goddamn sucks. Everything is harsh, wants to kill you, and probably itself too. Speaking of things that want to kill you, the Ancestor, the Narrator, and Wayne June. Remind yourself that overconfidence is a slow and insidious killer. He talks like the incestuous Habsburg nobleman equivalent of someone that would get posted to r slash I am very smart. For a character that wasn't even intended in the original design document, it's surprising how seamless he fits into the game. He sort of acts like a friend on Discord shit-talking your bad gameplay, while occasionally vomiting out an entire thesaurus. Monsters size has no intrinsic merit. If I was a middle school English student, I'd probably tell you that the theme of Darkest Dungeon is finding a glint of heroism amidst a sea of cowardice. Everything about the game, from the jagged art style to the voice lands mechanics and backstory and plot, are all extremely harsh and depressing. Hellion panics and runs from a fight, Musketeer seeks a dark god, Arbalist loses her father, Hound Master discovers a fellow officer as a torturer. All these comics are related to fear, stress, betrayal, and negative emotions in general, which is also, funnily enough, a game mechanic. The question the game is asking is pretty much, what if that unfallible, heroic knight actually pisses himself when he sees a huge demon. Because it's the norm for people to be scared in this game, and I mean, rightfully so, this is a horrific world, it makes all the times when, in a completely hopeless situation, your character overcomes the odds, stands up, you hear the ancestor go, Many fall in the face of chaos, but not this one. Not today. And not only do they bear the courage to break through their stress, but they also rally their terrified companions to rue the day. That is what makes Darkest Dungeon truly special in my eyes. Gameplay. There are two halves to this game, the strategy layer and the tactical layer. On the strategy layer, you manage your operations and your lads, and you can upgrade them as you see fit. On the tactical layer, you're out and about, killing horrible monsters and taking their loot back home, all while leveling up your own. But enough talking about XCOM, in Darkest Dungeon there's a few differences here. In XCOM, you inherit a giant pile of rock, and have to carve buildings into it over time. In Darkest Dungeon, you start with everything to begin with, but then you have to upgrade what you already have. The things you're managing are also significantly different. Instead of solely balancing the books and focusing on the panic of countries, you're instead focusing on balancing the books and the panic of your heroes. You can pick between four to six different base dungeons depending on DLC, and generally I would say there's something like this. For the Ruins, lead teams are gonna have a bad time. The Crusader definitely won't though. The Warrens is a disease-riddled shithole. The Cove is an annoying shithole, and the Wield is Prot Central shithole. 
Once you get on the ground, you have two main views. This one up top that's the claustrophobic view of your heroes, and this one at the bottom that's a clear indication of the layout of the dungeon that you're in. The devs explain that they went with this view because it feels more dramatic and emotional when you're closer to your heroes. And obviously that's pretty good when you're trying to instill a constant sense of fear and tension. Dungeoneering and characters. Every hero in the roster has got seven abilities alongside seven camping skills. This means that every character has unique ways in which they can be run, inviting plenty of different strategies and playstyles. Every ability can only be used from certain ranks, and attacks certain ranks. Not only is it incredibly easy to understand from the onset, it works really well at forcing you to think about hitting every single rank and how you'll deal with certain enemy types. For example, stress dealers are almost always placed in the back ranks, so you'll want to have people that can either displace them, like the bounty hunter, or murder them, like the bounty hunter. <laughs> Speaking of stress, everyone's got two main resource bars, health and stress. Health comes back completely after an excursion, but stress does not recover. The mental toll that adventuring takes on your hero has to be managed far more carefully. With some comps, this can be a total joke, but if you're actually playing the game the way it's intended, it works quite well. Alright, you did have your mind fucking blown. When you go to start a quest, you provision for it, and you get to buy all this crap. Each item has two uses, to cure yourself of a debuff, or to be interacted with curios. Curios are things you interact with in dungeons that can give anything from 50 stress to a bunch of loot. Interacting with certain curios with specific items will give you guaranteed rewards. This means that you'll always have to weigh your option between greeting for more loot or keeping your provisional items to counter dots and debuffs. And because of the lack of inventory space, you might be inclined to drop more crap for gold. Which, hold on a second, wait a minute. Choosing between greed and safety? Oh my god, it's like they weaved the theme of the game into the looting system! So what are the heroes themselves like? Well, let's go over them in a completely arbitrary order. Crusadre. Oh man, this guy is the greatest. I genuinely think Crusaders are probably a little bit overpowered, as they're just so generally applicable to every situation. This will come up a lot, so let me get the definition over with quickly. There are two different archetypes heroes fall into. Specialists and Generalists. Generalists are good in more situations than specialists, but specialists might be more powerful in a handful of situations. The Crusader is the epitome of a generalist. He works everywhere, at any comp, and probably at any rank, too. Four Crusader comps are genuinely very good. Drivewaymen. Dismas over here is absolutely amazing, and definitely jockeying for the absolute best class in the vanilla game. This is almost entirely because of two skills. Point Blank Shot and Duelist Advance. If you're in the first rank, you pop an incredibly high accuracy shot that is about as powerful as a Uranium Warhead. Drop back to second rank and use Duelist Advance to get Repost, which means you strike back against anyone that attacks you. Highwayman seems to be pretty prone to crits as well, but his base damage in general just means that he'll totally accidentally kill people with Repost all the time. Because of this versatility, he's a very good generalist. Vestal. She's about as boring as they come. Single target heal, party heal, stun, damage, blah, she works everywhere. Occultist. This dude is just so wacky. He's a healer, but he's also got the best stun in the entire game, except you have to be at second rank to use it? What? His heal is, um, l let's say infamous, and I personally think it's hilarious. Like, you could take a Vestal for consistent heals, or you could take Meth Wizard over here, who is summoning fucking Cthulhu to fix your broken bones. Let me do it, let me do it, let me do it, let me do it. Yo. <laughs> he's definitely more specialized than the Vestal, and he starts to truly shine with the team that can take advantage of his marks, and is also sometimes willing to, you know, get healed for nothing. Bounty Hunter. This guy fucks. He's got high base damage, and his main ability gets almost two times the damage to mark targets. Fittingly for the character, not much needs to be said, he just fucks. Like a cultist, he's a specialist in that he does effective work on his own, but he works well in a marking comp. Arbalist and Musketeer. These two are basically the exact same class, the latter given to Kickstarter backers. Their gimmick is pretty much the exact same as the Bounty Hunter, except at range. You can pick your poison of which you prefer between the Arbalist and the Musketeer. I just like guns. They're specialized in that they need a marking comp to work well. Leper. Quad Leper 2 OP, Valve please fix. Antiquarian. Extremely interesting hero design that ditches actually being good in a fight for bringing back way more loot. You're pretty much gimping yourself by using her, but she'll bring back an incredible amount of money. She's a weird mix of generalists and specialists, where she sucks so much all the time that you need a specialized party to take her on, but she's generalist in that she sucks in this exact same way in every single party comp. Plague Doctor. Probably good in some comps, I don't care, there are better alternatives. Abomination. This guy is also fantastic. He's got two forms, a, um, let's say normal dude, and Big Scronculator. 
In dude mode, he's got a really good stun, a blight, a self heal, and a self stress heal. As big scrunculon, A bomb regularly instantly destroys people from full health. I don't know what the fuck's going on with this guy, he just can't stop himself from murdering people. He's very generally applicable, though keeping him in second rank is ideal. Grave robber. <laughs> Jester. Jester is one of my favorite heroes in the entire game. He's focused on two things buffing and stress healing your own party bleeding, and doing insane amount of damage with Finale. Wait, that's three things. Fuck. His bit is that all of his moves are a lead up to his big swan song, Finale, where he instantly removes someone from life and retreats to the back of your party. It can only be used once per fight and usually does, um, a little bit of damage. He's specialized in that he needs a comp that's alright with shuffling to be effective. He moves around a lot with his moves, and if someone can't attack because of it, he's a pretty large detriment. After doing some theory crafting, I have a few things to add about the Jester. He's a lot more broken than I originally thought. Solo is a move that's usually underlooked in his moveset, and now I think it might be his most powerful. It throws you to first rank, marks you, and gives you 20 dodge. This sounds pretty insubstantial, however the Jester has incredible base dodge. Throw some dodge trinkets on him and you'll pretty easily be able to get him to max dodge. This means you can have someone with a 10% chance to get hit at the front of your party, who is marked and will tank all enemy attacks and almost never get hit. To follow up, you can use either Dirk Stab or immediately Finale. The bonuses Solo gives Finale are really significant, and you can probably one-shot an enemy on the second round. For most short hallway fights, I think Solo into Finale into spamming Battle Ballad or his Stress Heal is the way to go. Hellion. Another class that's probably good, but makes me want to fall asleep. She does alright damage, and that's it, that's the whole character. She gets a double stun and that's it, really. Oh, and she, she debuffs herself with her own moves. Generalist, boring everywhere. Houndmaster. He can barely be hit if he puts his mind to it with a really high base dodge chance and a guard that increases his dodge even further. Combined with a dodge trinket and yeah, you're not hitting him. Other than that, he has alright attacks with his dog and they kind of have underwhelming bleeds but they're good enough. Flagellant. Pretty fun class with, unlike the Houndmaster, the best bleeds if not dots as a whole in the entire game. He has fun gimmicks with Death's Door as well, though this usually results in a death. Works in pretty much every comp, though not in the ruins. Shieldbreaker. The darkest dungeon equivalent of a Smash 599 character. Man at Arms. Ah! The Plot. The Ancestor is like the biggest douche you could possibly imagine except a hundred times worse and out to destroy the world. Oh, and he's also you. After every boss, the Ancestor will go into detail about how they played into his Machiavellian plan to unearth the secrets of the manor, which are, naturally, rather eldritch in nature. Underneath the manor, the Ancestor unearthed the Thing. Seems like after he unearthed the Thing, all the peasants from neighboring villages came to kill him in protest and destroy the hamlet. I mean, can't imagine why. He kills himself in the intro, sends the letter off to you, and you're off to fix his mess. Each and every one of the bosses are created in some way by the Ancestor. The Necromancer is someone the Ancestor invited over, learned how to perform necromancy from, killed them in their sleep, and then brought them back. The Prophet showed up in the Hamlet and told of how the Ancestor was going to bring the end to the world. The Ancestor got sick of him, showed him exactly how right he was, and he committed suicide on the spot. The Hag was a local botanist who went insane as she worked with the Ancestor. The Brigand Pounder was operated by mercenaries the Ancestor hired to slaughter the rebellious population of the Hamlet. Both the Swine Prince and the Flesh were a collection of failed summonings. The Siren was a woman infatuated with the Ancestor. Naturally, he threw her into the ocean and took her jewelry. Lastly, the Drowned Crew were a group of sailors who traveled the world to grab things for the Ancestor. When they asked for a huge pay raise, he agreed, then hexed their anchor and sunk them into the icy depths. After you kill all, or maybe just most of the bosses, and get enough people to level 5 with good trinkets, you can start the Darkest Dungeon. These quests are 100% set in stone, so go look up a guide before you do them. Or don't, it's not a rule book. In the third and final Darkest Dungeon quest, you fight the Ancestor, who reveals that he is fused with the Thing. You kill him and the Thing with it, after it instantly murders two of your party members, and in the final cutscene, the Ancestor reveals that the Thing was not totally beaten and can never be. He had lured you in chasing both it and himself as every hero death along the way fueled the thing further. Then, presumably, you fuse with it, unleash the thing, the peasants revolt, the hamlet is destroyed, another letter is sent off to your next of kin, and the cycle is restarted. Ruin has come to our family. Mods. There are two paths a Darkest Dungeon modder can take. They either install mods that fit the art style of the game, or... Nah. Oh no, 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 no. I don't quite know what's up with the community. Taking the second path seems really tone deaf. It's like taking Sun Tzu's Art of War and then slapping an anime girl on every other page. So I'm gonna act like all that doesn't exist and instead focus on the fact that this game's modding community is crazy good. There are genuinely helpful mods to help you plan runs, untold amount of class mods, 
skin mods. Uh, oh god. And of course, a reminder to drink water. 10 out of 10 mod. If you have a problem with the game, as with many PC games, there's a good chance mods are gonna fix it for you. Hell, if you're completely unhappy with the balance of the vanilla game, you can install a mod like the Forgotten Dungeons, which completely redoes the balance of the entire game. The devs highlight a good handful of mods every week. Well, every week is a bit generous. So scrolling down these is a pretty good way to find decent mods as they'll be practically endorsed by the devs. And this is what Dismas canonically looks like now. Fight me. Darkest Dungeon 2. As you might be aware, a sequel to the game I've been talking about for about... Jesus Christ, how long? 20 minutes? 25 minutes? I don't know however long it's been. Released recently. It's, uh, it's alright. They ditched their entire metagame strategy layer, and it's purely a Slay the Spire style roguelike now. I get what they're trying to do. People complained a lot about Darkest Dungeon 1 being too grindy, and to fix this, they gave characters a lot less weight. Losing them no longer really matters, because it doesn't impact your overall run, because you don't have an overall run. Before the game released, I thought this was a really smart choice, but overall, I think it really hurt the game. A complete lack of a strategy layer outside of each run is totally baffling to me, and to be quite honest, terrible. It never really feels like you're working towards anything, except maybe grinding to unlock characters you actually want to use. Seriously, you gave me the goddamn Grave Robber and the Man of Art? God, it's like they didn't even watch this video! At the time of writing, the balance is also totally fucked. You get genuinely punished for winning at five stress or more, there's what feels like a 50% chance that someone will go, THAT KILL WAS MINE, after you murk someone. This spirals into hateful relationships, which spirals into heart attacks, which lowers your relationships even more, and ends up causing a spiral effect that never ends. Oh, and sometimes, you random roll an encounter with a shambler. What the fuck did you want me to do here? On the other side of things, if everyone managed to love each other, the game was way too easy and a total cakewalk. With some balance tweaks, it could be a really cool, interesting system. As it stands, it's four teenagers either seething with hatred for each other over practically nothing while trying to save the world, or a polycule getting through on the power of friendship. I've seen some people complain that it looks kind of uncanny valley, but I am absolutely astonished by how it looks. I don't want to think about how much time it took Chris and whoever else to do this. At the minute, Darkest Dungeon 1 is a far more consistently enjoyable experience, though I trust Red Hook that 2 will get there eventually. Hello. It is now currently 4 a.m. This video has taken me a month to make. If you don't press the like and subscribe buttons, I will find you and I will burn down your house.